we're here at a time when a popular Democratic president who is a constitutional lawyer by trade has expanded, intensified, continued, and most importantly legitimized in the eyes of many liberals some of the most egregious aspects of what the Bush administration called its counterterrorism policy and the Obama administration continues to call its counterterrorism and national security policy. And despite the fact that this very popular Democratic president campaigned on a pledge to radically change the way that the U.S. conducted its business around the world, and upon taking power, issued a number of executive orders that were purportedly aimed at shutting down secret prisons, ending torture, and closing Guantanamo. What has actually happened is that the Obama administration has made cosmetic changes, tweaked the language, made a few adjustments to the detention program, to the what's called the targeted killing program, but it's anything but targeted as we've seen so often. It's an assassination program. And this administration has sold the idea to many liberals in this country that this is a clean war, that it's a smarter war than the ones that were being waged by his predecessor. If you look at the administration's claims of bringing the Iraq war to an end, you have to examine what was on President Bush's desk the day he left office. It was the very plan that President Obama implemented. It was already in motion. So the, this administration did not bring an end to the Iraq war. The Bush administration's plan was implemented. But also we've seen an expansion of CIA paramilitary activity in Iraq over the past several months. The largest embassy in the world is the US Embassy in Baghdad, and strike teams continue to operate out of it alongside thousands of mercenary forces. In Afghanistan, the Obama administration is waging two wars. The conventional war that you see through embedded journalism, and then the covert war that we seldom see, which consists of special operations, night raids, drone strikes, and snatch operations. In Afghanistan itself, the US military and the CIA continue to run detention facilities that are categorized as filtration sites so that people can be held incommunicado because they're not categorized as prisoners, they're categ categorized as potential intelligence assets that can be used in interrogation to produce the next night raid or the next drone strike. Under this administration, US intelligence agents utilize a secret prison that is buried in the basement of Somalia's US-funded National Security Service. When Richard Rowley, the director of our film, and I flew into Mogadishu, Somalia in the summer of 2011, and we landed in the airport, at the airport, at Aidenada Airport, as the plane taxied and made its way to the gate, we noticed what to us looked like a forward operating base that we had seen in Afghanistan. It was a large walled compound with small hangars inside of it, and then a small cluster of buildings that resembled a small village, and it looked just like other forward operating bases, except that it had a pink hue. It was sort of the, the walls had been pink washed on this uh, building, and the Somalis called it the pink house. And when we, when we landed and we started asking our Somali contacts, what's that building? They said, oh, that's, that's Guantanamo. And then that was the nickname that they had given for it. But what, it was shorthand for saying that's where the Americans are based. And what it, it turns out it was, and I found this out from interviewing Somalis who were liaisons with the Central Intelligence Agency and US military intelligence, is that the Obama administration had initiated a targeted killing and snatch operation based out of that airport, where they were building an indigenous capability of Somalis that could hunt down individuals that were suspected to be members of, or members of Al-Shabaab, the Somali uh, militant group that pledged its allegiance to Al-Qaeda. And these agents, I was told by, by the Somalis that were helping the CIA to run this program, are lined up monthly and paid $200 in cash for being part of this targeted kill capture operation. In the case of captured prisoners, they take the ones that they determine to have intelligence value and they hold them in the basement of this National Security Services building, which is a bed bug infested gulag. Prisoners are not given access to the outside world. 
They're not given access to lawyers. The Red Cross, when I was on Democracy Now! talking about this when I came back from Somalia, the Red Cross said it was, had never heard of the facility, and then I gave them the address on the air and told them where they could go and find it, and to my knowledge, they haven't followed up on it. But I discovered, I discovered that prison because I met a colleague in Somalia who works for an international news organization who's Somali, who had been put in that prison in retaliation for filming an operation that the US-backed Somali forces didn't want him taking pictures of. And he was put into that prison as a warning. And he said when he was there, he saw American and French agents interrogating prisoners. So I started to investigate the story. And I found out that there was a prisoner named Abdullahi Hassan, who was a Kenyan of Somali descent, who was in that prison. And he had been snatched from his home in Eastley, the Somali neighborhood in Nairobi, and shackled, hooded, and driven to Wilson Airport in Nairobi, and then <coughs> shipped to Somalia, where he was put in this basement prison. And we were able to get testimony smuggled out of that prison of him describing the story and describing how he was interrogated by American agents around the clock, and how he hadn't seen a lawyer, can't commu communicate with his family, and it has no access to the outside world. When I called the CIA for comment on the condition of this prisoner, they confirmed that he had been snatched on orders from the United States government, and that he was being held in that prison, and they said he was dangerous, and it's good that he's taken off the streets. They said that he was one of the advisors to the then head of Al-Qaeda in East Africa, Saleh Ali Nabhan. And so this man was snatched, on orders from the US government while Obama, President Obama is in office, sent to a secret prison in the basement of a US funded agency, and then interrogated at times by US intelligence and military intelligence personnel. And the CIA did not dispute any of those facts that I reported. They simply said, well, it's more that we sit in on debriefings with Somalis when they're interrogating. So that is the reality of one aspect of the rendition program, the secret prison program, and I think it also speaks to torture and definitions of torture. So President Obama and CIA Director Leon Panetta said in early 2009 that we're out of the secret prison business, that we brought an end to torture. But what we know and what we can prove is, is taking place is a sort of backdoor continuation of the policy by tweaking it. In fact, it's very similar to the rendition program under President Clinton in the 1990s. People try to heap everything and say that the, the, the beginning of all the problems happened when Bush and Cheney were in power. Bush and Cheney continued many of the Clinton-era doctrines on these core issues. President Clinton tried to assassinate Saddam Hussein. President Clinton authorized cruise missile strikes that blew up a pharmaceutical plant in Sudan and bombed Afghanistan as well. Clinton sustained the longest that initiated the longest sustained bombing campaign since Vietnam under the guise of the so-called no-fly zones in the north and south of Iraq. And he also initiated the rendition program. And so President Obama spoke of it, bringing an end to all of these things, but then found a way to continue them. And as the surge happened in Afghanistan and the drawdown happened in Iraq, we saw the Obama administration unveil what would become one of the linchpins of its counterterrorism policy, and that is the intensification of US drone wars. So in Pakistan, the number of drone strikes increased exponentially under President Obama. He also began issuing a series of secret orders at times through General David Petraeus, who was the CENTCOM commander responsible for all military op operations in the Middle East. And they started to issue what are called execute orders for Joint, spe Joint Special Operations Forces commandos, elite SEALs, Delta Force, Army Rangers, and others to begin penetrating countries that were outside of the stated battlefields, like Yemen and uh, Mali and Somalia and elsewhere in East Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, and began constructing drone bases in Saudi Arabia, in Djibouti, where the US has its major hub of operations in East Africa. Camp Lemonnier was a French military base that was taken over by the US. And so you had the expansion of these wars where you didn't have embedded journalists, you didn't have congressional hearings, and the administration tried to portray its drone war as a smarter, cleaner war. But there is no such thing as a clean war. And what we see happening right now is that the signature strikes 
This policy that Cade mentioned has become the tip of the spear of US policy in both Yemen and Pakistan, where you have what is almost, it's a grotesque form of pre crime where people, because of the region that they live, the fact that they're quote unquote military aged males, and they may or may not have had association with certain people, makes them worthy of preemptive designation as terrorists. And so when they're killed, and then we hear, hear a report about 11 militants being killed, or suspected militants being killed, oftentimes those are people that have been determined through the pre-crime process, and it, that's even not the right term, because who knows if they were even going to commit a crime. When you're killing people whose identities you don't know, who you have no intelligence to speak of that they're actually involved with criminal activity or plotting terrorist acts, and you bomb them, what you've done in doing that is to create new enemies that have an actual legitimate grievance against the United States. Our actions in Pakistan and Yemen and Somalia are going to come back to blow against us. It will be blowback. We will pay a price for our actions around the world. There is no clean war in Yemen. There is no clean war in Pakistan. When President Obama was asked about his resolve during the political campaign, he said, ask the 22 or 30, I forget which, which number, uh, leaders of Al-Qaeda who've been killed under my administration about my sense of resolve. And it's true. They've killed a number of, of, of leaders. The number three man in Al-Qaeda has been killed 20-something times. <laughs> Syed al-Shiri, Syed al-Shiri, who's one of the heads of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, by my count, has died eight times this year and just released a new audio tape last week. But, but there have been individuals that we're told are these notorious leaders of Al-Qaeda that have been taken out, and some of them very clearly have been involved with horrid activities. But for the most part, the end result of the drone policy has been to inflame hatred, to inspire new enemies. And a story that, that, that has affected me very deeply, that I think should be of great concern to uh, everyone in this country, uh, is the story of what happened in September and October of 2011, when President Obama authorized operations in Yemen that resulted in the deaths of three US citizens. Now I want to preface what I'm about to say with this. I don't believe that we should ever view the lives of American citizens as worth more than any other people in the world. On a moral level, there should be no difference in how we view the killing of someone in a village in Pakistan to how we view the killing of a kid born in Den Denver, Colorado. But it is a relevant story to us here in the United States because it cuts to the heart of how far off the cliff we've fallen, particularly since 9-11 and under Democratic and Republican administrations alike. We now have a process in the chambers of power in Washington where a small group of men and women meet on Tuesdays, and they call it Terror Tuesdays, to decide who's going to live and die around the world, to go over lists of people that are on the target list, off the target list. What's our intelligence on this person? What patterns of life is this person engaged in? Can they be made a legitimate target? And these meetings then result in briefings to the president of people that the CIA or the Joint Special Operations Command want taken out. There are at least three separate kill lists that are being run in the US government. The CIA has a kill list, JSOC has a kill list, and then the National Security Council has a working group that also keeps its own list of high value targets. For all I know, there could be more, but those are the three that we know exist. And they've also developed something called the disposition matrix, which is an attempt to create a sort of algorithm for determining if someone could be captured or we need to kill them. If someone can be taken by cooperation with the local government or we need to send in a team of SEALs if someone should be taken out by a drone strike, or if we should try to seek to capture them through other means. This administration is normalizing the process of assassination as a central component of US policy for many generations to come. And I don't believe for a moment that if John McCain had won the election, or Mitt Romney had won the election, that you would see polls indicating that 70% of self-identified liberals support drone strikes, and that the support for it would drop only negligibly in the case of a US citizen. I think that this has been a political campaign to sell this idea and this program to liberals, 
and the results are going to be far-reaching for generations to come. So on this particular operation I started to tell you about, on September 30th, 2011, President Obama was presented with a choice by Admiral William McRaven, who was the head of the U.S. Special Operations Forces, and by the CIA. And it was a decision about whether or not he should kill an American citizen with a drone strike that had not, and the citizen had not been charged with a crime and had not, had not been indicted and had not had evidence publicly presented against him to back up the leaks that were being uh, used to litigate the case against a man named Anwar al awlaki There was no indictment, there was no charge, there was no evidence publicly presented against him. And on this day, September 30th, 2011, President Obama served as the prosecutor, the judge, the jury, and ultimately the executioner of a U.S. citizen who had not been charged with a crime and authorized a drone strike that killed Anwar al awlaki and another U.S. citizen named Samir Khan who was a Pakistani-American from North Carolina. Samir Khan was widely believed to have been the editor-in-chief of Inspire magazine, the publication of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. But I know the Khan family, and I spoke to his mother, Sarah Khan, and she described to me the repeated visits of the FBI to their house before Samir's death, and the FBI said, there's no indictment against Samir, he's not charged with a crime, we want to encourage you to get him to come home, but he hasn't done anything that we feel, that we believe is unlawful, but we're concerned about who he might be with. And so you have this American citizen killed in this operation who the FBI was telling the family hadn't been charged with a crime. After those two were killed, one Republican congressman said that, well, if Samir Khan wasn't on the kill list, it's still a bonus. It was a twofer, he called it. So these two individuals were killed in this drone strike. And the response in Washington fell into two basic camps. Silence or enthusiastic support. Hillary Clinton, Dianne Feinstein, uh, John McCain, all rushed to celebrate the assassination of two US citizens. The only people in, on Capitol Hill that made a peep after those killings were Dennis Kucinich, the former congressman from Ohio, and Ron Paul from Texas, who had, at the time was running an insurgent campaign for the Republican nomination for president. Congressman Kucinich is an interesting character in this story because he, when we first found out that they had Americans on the kill list, which it was happened because the Washington Post had published a story in January 2010, Dennis Kucinich put forward a bill that said that the United States government does not have the right to extrajudicially execute its citizens without due process and only six members of Congress signed on to that legislation. Not a single senator. You know, it's ironic to watch the filibuster with Rand Paul uh, that day and some of them, the Tea Party cavalcade or cavalry coming through there. Where were all of these people before the killing started in this way when Dennis Kucinich was trying to actually get people to pay attention to it? Even after this killing, it wasn't an issue at all in most political circles, and certainly not in the political elite circles in Washington. But then two weeks later, another drone strike occurred in Yemen. And this time, among the victims was a 16-year-old boy, whose only crime in life appears to have been that his last name was Awlaki, and that his father was Anwar Awlaki. This was a kid who was born in Denver, Colorado, in August of 1995. He spent the first seven years of his life in the United States, and when he moved back to Yemen with his father and mother and his siblings, they were living in the family's home in Sana'a. And Nasr al laki his grandfather, Anwar's father, is an upstanding citizen. He is a man who came to the United States as a Fulbright scholar in 1966 and adored and still adores the United States. He is a man who wanted his children to have a college education from the US. When he had come here to get his education, he wanted to stay, but he decided to de devote his life to dealing with Yemen's water crisis, which is severe. And he built the Department of Agricultural Engineering with money from the US Agency for International Development in Sana'a. And Ray was trying to raise his children to be academics or to be scientists or to be engineers. And when Anwar took a different path and became an imam, and that's a whole story that I tell in the book of his 
how he became who he was. It didn't happen in a vacuum. It had a lot to do with what the US did after 9-11 that, that pushed him to become what he eventually was. But this boy, this teenage boy, Abdul Rahman al -Laki, hadn't seen his father since May of 2009. Because when his dad went underground, Anwar left his children with his father, with his father to raise. And this kid, I looked through all of his Facebook posts, the family videos, talked to his friends, was into hip hop music. He had this huge unruly afro that his grandfather and his mother were constantly picking on him to, to cut. They wanted him to cut his hair. There's photos of him posing with his friends like rappers. We have one video where he's sort of in the streets reenacting a video game scene with his friends. And the videos that we've seen from their family show a gentle older brother to his younger siblings, and everyone we've talked to said that he was a quiet, gentle, smart boy. And this kid is living with his grandparents while his father has become public enemy number one, and the Americans are hunting him with the CIA and JSOC. And his grandfather's raising him with dreams of sending him to the US to go to university. And a few days before his father was killed, this kid runs away from home, from his grandparents' house. He stole the equivalent of $40 from his mother's purse. He packed a small bag, he hopped out the kitchen window. He boarded a bus in Babel Yemen, in the old city in Sana'a. And he took the bus to where he thought his father was, which was Shebwa province, the scene of repeated drone strikes by the US trying to kill Anwar al -Laki. His grandmother told me that she was afraid when he left that it would be bait for the CIA, that they were maybe going to track his telephone calls if he managed to get in touch with his father or read his text messages. They also wonder if maybe uh, the CIA was following him the, the whole time. When Rick, when Rick and I, the director of our film, when we went into the al home in Sana the first time, all of the, we couldn't find an open frequency for, to record the audio of the interview because there were so many waves going through the house, they were being monitored from every angle, we couldn't find an open channel. So that family we know was being followed. But this, this and the, the, I tell a story about how Anwar Alaki's youngest brother, Amar, who works for an oil company, they approached him in Vienna, Austria, the CIA, and tried to pay him $5 million to give up the location of his brother. The CIA also found a bribe for Anwar Alaki using a Danish spy named Morton Storm. They arranged a marriage for Anwar Alaki, and so they supported his, uh, his, his wife underground. But this kid, Abdul Rahman, he's there, he's looking for his father, he's waiting in Shabwa province, and he, is there when his father was killed in a drone strike. Not in Shabwa, but in the north of Yemen. And his grandmother called him and said, Abdul Rahman, it's finished, you have to come home. Your father is dead. And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to come home, but the roads are blocked because the Arab Spring was happening and there was a revolt against Ali Abdullah Saleh, the US-backed dictator in Yemen. So he couldn't make it back to Sana'a, so he had to wait in his family's tribal province. And he went into a depression and his relatives were saying, Abdul Rahman, you need to get out and do something. Go out with your cousins, go out with the other kids from the, the neighborhood. And one night they were all out, gathered in an outdoor restaurant at about nine o'clock. And a drone appeared above them and launched a missile and blew up 16-year-old Abdul Rahman al -Laki, his 17-year-old cousin Ahmed, and all of the other kids that were with them. And when the reports came that this kid had been killed and was among the dead, a military, US military official leaked a story that he was 21 years old. And then the al had to produce the birth certificate showing that he was born in August of 1995 in Denver, Colorado. And then they said that he was an, uh, a suspected militant himself and that he was at an Al-Qaeda meeting. And then they said he was actually collateral damage. He was killed because he was meeting with an Egyptian member of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula named Ibrahim Albana. And then AQAP releases a statement saying that's a lie, Ibrahim Albana wasn't there and he's still alive. And AQAP actually has a much better track record than the US government at deciding when the number two guy in Al-Qaeda gets killed. I mean, they're, they're, they're generally reliable when they say someone is alive or dead. And Ibrahim Albana, as far as we know, is, is still very much alive. And so then the question became, how was it that this kid was killed, this 16-year-old US citizen who was not his father, who played video games, hung out in the chain square with the nonviolent revolutionaries, had an afro, listened to hip hop, and, and spent most of his time being an older brother and a goof off. How is it that he was killed two weeks after his father? The coincidence just seemed impossible to take, and I've spent the past almost two years trying to get an answer to this question. Why was Abdul Rahman al killed? Because for me, the answer to that question says a lot about what kind of nation we are and what kind of nation we want to be. 
And, and, and yet there are no answers. The Obama administration has never been asked about it. Uh, President Obama has never been asked about it at all of those press conferences. He has never had to face the direct question, even though he's in charge of the program. When Robert Gibbs was asked by uh, a, a, an enthusiastic young reporter named Sierra Adamson about why Abdul Rahman was killed, Robert Gibbs' answer was he should have had a more responsible father. There is no, I can think of almost nothing more shameful than blaming the killing of a child on who their parents are or were. The, the paying for the sins of your parents, there, there is a reprehensible criminal idea that you would blame the killing of a child on something that their parents had done when that kid wasn't even with his father. Then they tried to say, well, he was sitting next to him. When Harry Reid, the, the leader of the Senate, the, the Senate Majority Leader, was asked on CNN by Candy Crowley about the killing of Anwar al-Awlaki, Samir Khan, and Abdul Rahman al -Laki, his answer was that if there were any three Americans that deserved to die, those three did. And I went after Harry Reid and tried to get him to answer, when you said those three did, you realize that one of them was a 16-year-old boy who had never been charged with a crime and wasn't with the other two at the time, and his office would never provide a response as to why he said that. And as the majority leader of the Senate, he has access to the intelligence on these strikes and refused to talk about it. Then I, I, I recently met a former senior official uh, who uh, was working on the kill program for the first, the entire duration of the first term of Obama and was part of the process targeting Anwar al laki at, at the highest level of the US government. And when I asked him what happened there, he said that the, the CIA and JSOC had told the president that Ibrahim Albana was alone. And he claimed we didn't know, he said we didn't know that the kid was there. And I continued to press him on that and he said that John Brennan, who at the time was the senior advisor on counterterrorism and homeland security, believed that either JSOC or the CIA had intentionally targeted Abdul Rahman al -Laki. And that Brennan ordered a review of that strike to determine how it was that he was killed. No review certainly has been published, if it ever will be. And the, the official said he wasn't sure what ever happened with the review. But then he assured me it all was unsure, a big misunderstanding an outrageous mistake. And I said, well, if it was simply a mistake and it was co collateral damage, why didn't you own it? Why don't you say it publicly? And he said to me, look, we had just killed three American citizens in a two-week period, two of whom weren't even targets, Samir Khan and Abdul Rahman al -Laki. That doesn't look good. It was embarrassing. It was embarrassing is the, is the most current answer we have as to why this administration has not answered how it was that a 16-year-old U.S. citizen was killed in this drone strike. I'm looking forward to talking with Amy and, and Noam, and I want to wrap up by, by just saying something that brings things back locally here. You know, we all watched, of course, with horror what happened in, in your city, um, in Boston. And, uh, and I, I, I've been thinking a lot about the way that the media coverage has unfolded, the leaks, the presumptions about motivation for these attacks. And we live in this society now where this, this other young man here, who, who was, his image was put around, and it's this student who was missing, and they said that he's a suspect, and now he's been found dead. And that family was dragged through the mud and, and tarred for something that their son had nothing to do with. And you, you saw the racism and, and, and the bigotry that's, that, that grips people when these events happen. I was asked on this, about this when I was on an MSNBC the other day by Martin Bashir. He asked me to comment on this, and I said, well, at the risk of seeming out of place on cable news, I'm not going to speculate until we see actual evidence or information. <laughs> <laughs> and then a few days after this Sarnayev uh, kid was taken into custody, something extraordinary happened, and that was a young man named Faraya al Muslimi from Yemen. Uh, testified in front of the U.S. Senate. And I know Faraya, I met him in, I met him in Yemen, and he's an extraordinary uh, young man. Uh, incredibly articulate, sharp, uh, manages to say scathing things about Al-Qaeda, the Arabian Peninsula, and in the same breath turn it to the U.S.-backed dictatorship. He's consistent in his morals, um, and, 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 and he's such a young man, but he has moral clarity that I wish so many of us had. 
And when he was asked about Boston, he said something that I think is profound to the, to the reporter who has a kid, a young man in front of him, who, whose own village was drone bombed in Yemen six days before he testified in front of the US Senate. And he was live tweeting the bombing of his village from text messages he was getting from his relatives who were near the scene. And then he ends up in front of this powerful body in the United States and reporters are asking him, what do you think of Boston? And he said, the difference between you and me is that I condemn both of them. I condemn both of them. And it's profound. <laughs> the media coverage of the victims of that bombing has been outstanding, of the bombing in Boston. We know the names, the stories of heroes who responded. We know the future taken away uh, from children and grad students. Um, because the media, the journalists are doing their job. They're informing the public. They're humanizing the people who were victimized and targeted in that bombing. Because only if we have empathy for others and we realize the humanity of, of, of others can we actually muster up the strength to stand and do the right thing or to call for justice. If we have that kind of coverage of the victims in the drone bombing of Faraya Muslimi's village, or we saw the humanity of Abdul Rahman al laki and his teenage cousins who were bombed on, on a, in an operation authorized by a popular democratic constitutional law professor president. If we saw the humanity in the real widows of Baghdad, instead of being obsessed with the real housewives of Los Angeles or Beverly Hills or whatever, if we actually see them as human beings, then the game changes, the equation changes. Because you don't view it through a nationalist lens. You don't view it through the lens of American exceptionalism. You view it as all of our responsibility as human beings to, to stand up even when someone is in power, especially when someone is in power who you may have voted for, or who you like, or who you think is the lesser of two evils. That's when your principles are tested. You know, a society's values are not defined. Our values are not defined by how we treat the rich and the powerful and the popular. It's defined by how we treat the least of our people, how we treat the poor, and it's also how we treat the most reprehensible. And so I can, I can talk for an hour about all the things that I think Anwar al laki did that were reprehensible. And I can talk about orders to target specific cartoonists. And we can talk about the smoke around his interactions with various people that the US has determined to be terrorists. All, Everything they've leaked in the media. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. But if we are not going to give that man due process, then we should change our constitution. We live in a different society then. We shouldn't project this idea that we have anything resembling the rule of law unless it can apply in the most inconvenient of cases. That's the standard that we should be judged by. And that's our challenge. And it's the challenge of young people. And there's a lot of young people in the room tonight to keep the struggle going, to build a world where justice prevails and where humanity is recognized with no difference between nationality or citizenship. Thank you. to be here um, with Jeremy Scahill and Noam Chomsky. And I wanted to start with Noam responding to Jeremy's investigations and the description, putting in the context of the history of US foreign policy. 